You know, I, I remember the time when my mom tried to teach me how to bake. I wasn't the best to instructions. So she eventually backed away and left me to fumble my way through the process. And so with reckless abandon and barely looking at the recipe, I whipped out a cake in no time flat. And that's when my mom instituted the guideline, the cook has to take the first bite. <laughs> now, in my ignorance, I, I thought, that's a great idea. And I took this first huge bite, and I nearly gagged. <laughs> we, event we discovered eventually that I had left out an ingredient. And I get the same feelings when confronting my computer screen. Have you ever sat there and had the computer screen go blank? and that proverbial blue screen of death comes up, right? <laughs> you haven't got the faintest idea why it's there. Nothing seems to correct the issue. I mean, at, at the bottom, you probably can't see that, but at the bottom it says, press any key. I've yet to find the any key. I have no, it's not on my keyboard. And in both instances, what has happened? There's the sense that if we just get one more ingredient or that one step we missed, then everything will be okay. Everything will be super. And that perception carries over into our relationship and our understanding with God. You know, we feel like we don't have the spiritual life we should or that we want. We find the frustrations, the challenges. Yes, Lord, thank you. <laughs> the only, that halo is the baldness of my head, okay? <laughs> Just so we got that straight. You know, we feel like we don't have the spiritual life we should or we want. Or we find the frustrations, the challenges, the problems of our lives seem to loom larger than God. And so what happens? We feel we're just not acceptable, God. We just, we're just not making the grade. We assume that the problem is that there's some missing ingredient. And so we go back and we check, check the list of ingredients that we think make up a good life, a good spiritual life. You know, the three easy steps that we're supposed to make this relationship with God work. Or the better thing is, we think, if we just do more, more Bible reading, more tithing, more good works, more prayer, God will like us. God will accept us. And the result is frustration. Now, at the beginning of the, this new year, we started a, a new sermon series in the book of Romans. And before Easter, we covered the first five chapters. And I want to take us through a quick summary of where we've been, okay? Remember, we started with the introduction. And Paul just introduces himself, notifies who his readers are, and then he comes down to this key verse that manages the whole rest of the book, where Paul writes, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, the non-Jew. For in it... The righteousness of God, the right relationship with God, is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And then he starts kind of the rest of the book. And he begins with what, what we call the failure of humanity. You know, in other words, in, in chapter 1, he, he says, because humanity is insisting, has insisted on having a life without God, being a God in their own life. God gives them over to what's on the inside. I call it the Burger King philosophy of life, where God says, okay, have it your way. How's that working for you? And then in chapter two, he begins with a failure of the moralist. The moralist proclaims, I'm not like the rest of humanity. I have standards. Yet sadly, Paul notes that they, you don't even live up to your own standards, much less God's standards. And then at the end of chapter two, the beginning of chapter three, is the religionist. You know, the person who's steeped in religion, they assume that their historical beliefs makes them immune from the rest of humanity. They're not like the moralist. We have, you know, religious beliefs. However, Paul shows that they, they become judgmental. They fail to live up to the tenets of their own religion. And so at, toward the middle of chapter three, he gives a summary of their failure. He says, hey, humanity has no excuse. In fact, that great... Quote, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There's nobody in a right relationship with God just automatically. That's the bad news. 
And we need the bad news so you can get the good news. And that's where he starts at the end of chapter 3 with the hope of justification by faith. Let me try to paraphrase Paul here. He writes something like this. But now, apart from performance or doing good, a right relationship with God the Father has been shown. It's shown all throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. It's the righteousness, the right relationship with God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who trust him. There's no distinction because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of the standard of God. We're declared righteous, and in that right relationship with God the Father is a gift by his grace through the payment made by Christ Jesus, whom the Father showed as that satisfying sacrifice by his blood through faith, that God is ultimately satisfied. God the Father is, hey, your, th- your sins are taken care of. And then in chapter 4, there's the illustration. Paul illustrates this by-faith relationship apart from performance through the lives of Abraham and David. Then in chapter 5, we covered the idea of the results. We're in a right relationship with God the Father. We have peace with him. We have the right, the privilege to interact with him freely. We have the new hope for the future. And we know that our present suffering has a purpose. And finally, we have an objective standard to measure God's love for us, that we can always have. It's the cross. We can look at the cross and know that God loves us. And then there's the lineage. We looked at two weeks ago, the the lineage of sin. Our trust in the death of Christ, and this alone makes us acceptable to God. And our position is now that we're sons and daughters, beloved daughters and sons. And this was Paul's argument at the end of Romans 5. We're united with Christ. We're, We're with him. He's with us. Now, up to this point in Paul's discourse, we've kind of been passive, okay? We've kind of been the recipient of all this. You know, Christ justifies us. God's now working with our tribulations for our good. While we were weak, while we were ungodly, while we were hating God, Christ dies for us. But in Romans 6, and and let's go ahead and turn there. If you you have your Bible this morning, turn to Romans chapter 6. That's where we'll be. Or... You can follow along the sermon outline that's in your bulletin. In chapter 6, we go from being passive to being participants. We're now active in our relationship with God. And Paul's next question opens the door to that participation with Jesus Christ and to be active in our relationship with God the Father. Look, look with me at, at Romans 6, one, where Paul writes, He writes, what shall we say then? In other words, what what shall we say to what we learned in chapter 5, that we're in union with Christ, with that reality? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin under the rule and reign of our sin nature so that grace may increase? In other words, shall we continue to help out our sinful nature? Let it rule and order our lives. Shall we continue to think and act as if we were God And we can run our own lives successfully. You see, some people were thinking this. They were thinking, well, if grace increases to cover my sin, then I might as well go out and sin more so God can show me grace. Okay? And this is the cry of someone who's frustrated by sin. They're frustrated by the emptiness of trying to live life on one's own terms. But we still have questions. You know, even the Christian has questions. You know, if I have this new relationship and position, why do I still react so negatively to criticism and slights from others? Why do I still find myself acting in ways that I know bring hurt and discord rather than grace and harmony? Why do I find myself enslaved to the same patterns of acting, feeling, or thinking? Why am I still caught up in this? See, our sinful nature, the the principle of sin within, acts as king in our lives. It gives us our marching orders. We find ourselves almost automatically reacting in ways that tear down the relationships around it, around us, and it tears down ourselves. And Paul responds to this question. He says, you've misunderstood your relationship to this principle of sin, the sinful nature operating in your life. And here's his response. He says, may it never be. Okay, you should have been way more excited about that. Okay, sorry, let me explain. 
that's the strongest, in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, that's the strongest denunciation it can be. May it never be. Don't even think about it. He says, how shall we, who are of such a nature, who died to sin, still live in? How shall we who have died to this sinful principle in our lives, how, how shall we continue to live in it? Paul's connecting back to the end of Romans 5, that we should recognize that when we were related to Adam, we're all in Adam's line, we were doomed. But that deliverance from doom occurred with Jesus Christ. And as far as our relationship to the sin principle is concerned, Paul says we've died to it. We've died to it. So it doesn't need to be a controlling factor in our lives anymore. We can be unresponsive to sin. Now, you may be saying, that's great. Where do I find that in Target? Where do I buy that? Well, Paul's going to give three actions that describe this new relationship to sin. And they encompass all who you are, all who a person is, our mind, our emotions, our will. And the purpose of these three actions is to enable you and I to sustain and enjoy the relationship that you have with God. Paul is basically saying this. He says, since you've died to the principle of sin because you've been united with Christ, this is how you and I should operate. So we're going to be talking about operating by design. And so Paul lists the first things that we should know by experience. Know by experience. Look at verse 3. He says, do you not know, literally, are you ignorant? That all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Now let me say this again. Some of you have heard me say this. We're a Baptist church. And we have a Baptist, baptismal right in front of us, right? <laughs> Yay, our side. Can I tell you that there's no water here? He's not talking about what we're going to do later on. What we're doing later on is a picture of what this is saying. Because the word baptize is, is just a Greek word taken over into English that means to immerse so as to identify. So we can read it this way. Do you not know that all of us who have been placed into so as to identify with Christ Jesus have been placed into his death? We've been identified with his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness in a new kind of life. For if we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So what, what are the things we're to know? Number one, we're to know that we're united and identified with Jesus Christ. Okay? Any native Greek speaker would never have thought of water baptism here. As I've noted, the term baptism is not a religious word. It's taken straight from Greek into English. It means to immerse so as to identify. In fact, it's a word that comes from the textile industry. For a piece of cloth to be plunged into, di into the dye, it has to be completely surrounded by this new element. And what Paul implies by his question in verse 3 is that trusting Jesus Christ was more than just having a Savior provided. Gosh, you get out from under that penalty. Instead, what he's saying is there's been a fundamental change and it has occurred in who we are. Paul wants to take us from the mentality that Jesus has merely saved us to the mindset that we're united with Christ in his person, we're identified, we're united with his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I'm identified with that. And then in verse 6, he goes on, he says, Know this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Here's the second thing we're supposed to know, is that our old self, this is, that's talking about the sin principle. Our old sin principle was crucified. The person that once we were once before we accepted Christ has died. The principle of sin that controlled, ruled us, has been rendered inoperative. It doesn't have to operate. It no longer has the right to force its mastery over us anymore. And the third, third thing we're supposed to know is that we can enjoy the same type of relationship with the Father that Jesus has. Think about it for a second. What type of relationship did Jesus have with God the Father? You get to have the same type. I get to have the same type of relationship. 
Look at verse 8. Now if, literally since, we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. That mean, what does this mean? This means that God the Father has the same attitude toward you that he has toward his son. We can enjoy this new quality of life based on a different principle. We can now operate based on a faith principle, not on the sin principle. These are the things we're to know. Now, now Paul's going to list the things we should consider. Verse 11, even so, consider yourselves dead to sin. I'm going to stop right there. Can I show you my education? The word dead is a word that means to be a corpse. Even so, consider yourselves a corpse to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, let me ask you. What's the distinguishing fact of a corpse? That's one idea. What's another one? <laughs> you, you don't respond, right? Corpses don't respond. When you carefully read, I know some of you are into zombie movies, but we're not talking about that, okay? <laughs> when you carefully read through the book of Romans, you find an astonishing truth. This, Romans 6.11, is the first command in the book. Paul's taken five chapters to explain the reality of your acceptance by God the Father through faith in the work of the Son. And he says, I want you to roll these truths around in your mind, and as you're doing that, you consider yourselves a corpse to sin, but alive to God. That word translated consider means to assume or reckon. If you look in a Greek lexicon, a lexicon is just a book that tells us what Greek words mean. It's defined as this, as a result of calculation, evaluate, estimate, look upon as. So with faith, with confidence, with trust, we're called to believe in something to be true that was not true of us before. Now, let's back up a little bit. It's not a matter of fake it till you make it, right? We're told that. Well, just pretend. Act or act as if something is true, but it's really not. What he's saying here, it's a matter of acting upon something that is true. I'm acting upon something that is true. And you see this principle when? When a child who's greatly loved spots the individuals who love them. You ever watch a child? Their face lights up. Their pace quickens. They throw themselves into welcoming arms. Whatever they were playing with a few minutes ago is forgotten. In the same way, we consider ourselves dead, unresponsive to sin, but alive and responsive to God the Father. Now, you and I are familiar with the opposite of that process. We can get a hurtful word, we can get a painful situation, an unnerving circumstance crashes into our lives, and we turn our entire focus and attention on that intruder and we literally become dead to God. We're so focused on that pain. We're so focused on that aspect of our life. You know, we forget about God. We, we may still go to church. We can still exist. We read our Bibles. We pray. We serve. We give. But we're more alive to this thing that has enslaved us than we are to God. And so we're to consider ourselves dead, unresponsive to sin, and our responsibility is to assume that by completely ignoring those realities, instead we're to build upon the relationship in Christ that we have God with the Father. We're to be a corpse to our sin and continually alive and responsive to God the Father. And we make this a reality by abandoning the darkness of unbelief and entering with confidence into this relationship with God. I consider myself, I don't have to respond to sin. I can be alive. I can move into God. And now what happens is Paul goes to this third area. He lists the things we should present. This is kind of the, the key here. In other words, okay, okay, these are things I know. I'm starting to consider it. What do I do? Look at verse 12. It says, therefore, do not let sin 
act as king, reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. What is Paul saying here? Paul declares, therefore, in light of what you know, your mind, in light of what you consider at your emotions, this is what you do. Here's your behavior. Remember, this is not a mindless road activity. This is just not adding a missing ingredient. We've rolled these things around in our mind. We've known, we've considered ourselves alive, responsive to God. So let, let's unpack this idea of presenting ourselves. He first of all says, stop allowing the sin principle to reign, to act like a king in your life. He says, don't let it rain in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Now, why does Paul say this? He makes this allowance because we become habituated to the sin principle in our lives. And he says, you've, you've gotten in the habit of that. You need to stop doing that, allowing it to reign like a king in your life. I was talking to somebody this week, talking about golfers. And I asked the question, what's your worst habit in golf? He said, you go first. Okay. <laughs> I've got a slice that could cut a block of cheese. Yeah, I get 200 yards, but it's 50 yards this way and 150 yards that way. Okay. Now, I had a friend growing up when we played golf. He was even worse. In order to hit the fairway, he would aim at a 45 degree angle over here. And that ball would loop back in and he'd go, everything's fine. There's nothing wrong with my golf game until you get to round to the green and everything shrinks down and then you run into sand traps and everything like that. See, sin reaches out and tweaks those deep inner moods. Now, I know none of you did this in elementary school. Okay, some of you are laughing already, so maybe you did. But you know, some dweeb would be sitting in front of you, and you would just reach up and flick their ear. Just like this, you know. Teacher has a back to you, like that, you know. What sin does, it reaches out. It tweaks our senses of shame and guilt and worthlessness. It, it, it tweaks our frustrations on our anxieties. And what do we do? We reach out to ease the pain caused by those moods. And we ease the pain through acts of sin that give us a temporary jolt of excitement. And Paul calls that slavery. In other words, if I feel hurt and angry, I want to lash out and hurt others. And when I do, I get this jolt of revenge. Oh, okay, I feel better. If I feel abandoned by people I trust, I reach out to hurt them back because then I get a jolt of control. Okay, I'm in control. I, I, I've got this mood of loneliness, and I satisfy it by having a desire to become sexually involved with another individual. You know, I live with them. I get a jolt out of sex. It gives me a jolt. Okay, I'm in control. But in all these scenarios, two things happen, okay? Number one, the personhood of, that, of my target is shattered. I'm no longer treating them like a person. I'm treating them like a thing to satisfy me. It can be a coworker, it can be a spouse, a partner, it can be a friend. I'm basically saying, you're, you're just good enough to be used. And the second thing is that the jolt only satisfies temporarily. I've gotta do it again to ease the growing hurt inside. And so what happens? This principle of sin becomes king in my life, it starts calling the shots. I feel these moods, I feel this stuff. Well, I gotta, I've gotta shut that down. Here's what I'll do. I'll do these things that give me that jolt. And so the second thing he says is he says, stop allowing my moods and passions, even my, my body to be presented to this sin principle. That's the second thing. Look at, look at the first part of verse 13. He says, don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Now, what is Paul assuming here? 
It's going to happen to us. It's going to happen to all of us. Okay? If I could, I would put a sign on every church that would say, if you're perfect, don't come. See, you can't come to this church if you're perfect. We will contaminate you. Especially the guy who's up on the platform right now. Okay? See, this process of our sinful nature is, is going to be first actualized in our moods, our passions, and then our physical body. Paul states, we need to say stop. In fact, the word present here, it's an interesting word. It means to stand around or near. You know what it's a picture of? It's a picture of a presidential aide or a king's aide. Standing around in the presence of somebody who rules your life and the one who rules your life says, go do this, and you go do it. It's a picture of being under someone's influence or command. It's not that you stop feeling, but it's when you feel a negative emotion, rather than pushing into it, letting it run away with you, I stop. But here's the kicker. What's the alternative? Just don't feel that way. Okay, you didn't believe that. Okay. I thought I was going to get away easy. Right? Oh, you just shouldn't feel that way. Oh, guess what? It, you know, it was your parents. It was climate change. It was, it's all these things. Instead of a lot, it's COVID, yes. <laughs> of course it is. It's always COVID. What are we to do instead? We're to present all we are, who we are to God. End of verse 13, it says, present yourself. Instead of being in touch with this guy that, the sin principle, he says, present yourself to God as those alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And Paul's using the imagery of warfare here. He says, stop presenting the members of your body to sin as weapons of unrighteousness, but immediately present yourself to God as one who's alive from the dead. Present your members as weapons of righteousness to God. See, here's the picture. Now, please follow along. This is important. That is when the sin principle begins to give commands as if it were in charge. How do you know that? When you begin to feel those negative emotions, anger, lust, hate, you know, uh, um, all those things that just consume us, we immediately in our minds march ourselves over to God the Father. And we choose to be more preoccupied with him through our position in Christ. We're more preoccupied with my relationship with the Father through the Son than I am with my sin. I want to hammer this home, okay? Because here's what we normally do. Sin comes, we start doing it, and we get preoccupied by sin. We get preoccupied by sin. We get, we get caught up in this. As a pastor, I hear, every, I hear about everybody's sin. And you know what my job is to do? I don't care about that. I don't care about that. You have to replace it with a substitute. The substitute is to press into God the Father. Well, but, but people at church can, they're, they're looking at my sin. Don't worry about the people at church. This will take care of this. Push into this. We don't ignore our feelings and desires that are pushing us. Instead, we present ourselves to the Father. You begin talking it out with him. I begin really to believe and act as if God exists. And Paul concludes this section with these words in Romans 6.14. He says this, For sin shall not be master over you. Why? You're no longer under law. You're no longer under the principle of performance, rule keeping. You're under grace. You You'll no longer have to keep dancing. I want to give you the picture that I use. I picture myself as an old vaudevillian actor. I come out on the stage and I start performing. I start dancing, I start singing. And the crowd doesn't like it. They start to murmur. So what do I do? I try to up my performance. 
I sing a little louder, I dance a little harder. Now the audience starts to boo. So what do I do? I sing a little louder, I dance a little harder. Then they start throwing tomatoes, you know, right? We get caught in that path, and it's kind of like, performance is not gonna do it. God says, stop trying to fix this. Come to me and I'll help you take care of that. Be more preoccupied with me than you are with, my, with sin. Now there's two false images of sin that we've gotta be aware of. The first is this, okay? False image number one. There will be a time on earth when we will no longer sin. Okay, I'm glad you don't believe that. (laughs) The Apostle John says that's impossible. In fact, in his first uh, letter, he says this. This is the message we've heard from him, we've heard from Jesus. We announce to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, if we say that we have fellowship, the word means to partner, if we partner with him, yet we walk, the word means we order our lives, In the darkness, we order our lives outside of him, we lie and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, here he's talking about sinful nature. If we say we don't have a sin nature, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He's faithful. He's righteous. He'll forgive us our sins and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? We're moving into him. We're moving away from this. If we say that we have not sinned, committed acts of sin, we make him, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. And then then John makes this admission. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I love the next verse. And if anyone sins, what's the assumption? It's, yeah, since you're going to, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the atoning, the satisfying sacrifice for our sins. He's paid the penalty for us. And not only for, ours only, for our sins only, but also for the whole world. And so how does God look at the Christian? It's done. Christ has paid that penalty. You have the freedom now to push into me. What's the second false image? The second false image that we have to be aware of is I will always be under the control and domination of any sin. Both John and Paul say say no. Sin is never to be the focal point of your life. The hurt, the slights, the victimization, of ourselves by others is never to be the center of our lives. If it is, sin rules over us. We're gonna be enslaved by it. But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as as is common to man. In other words, hey, we all suffer through it. God is faithful. He'll not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, we'll provide the way of escape so that you'll be able to endure it. He's not saying you won't be tempted. He'll say, I've got a path for you. Stop giving in to the more principle. If I read my Bible more, if I go to church, if I give more, if I work harder, the Father's declared there's a way to endure it. Press into him. Jesus pointedly responded to some religious leaders of his time about this more principle. Look at this verse. He said to these religious leaders, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Did you know if you were a rabbi in first century, you knew what the center word of the Old Testament was? You knew how many words there were? You, know, you knew how many times a certain word? You knew all the, de- you, you could win Bible trivia. He says, you think, you look at the scriptures, because you think just because I know all this stuff, you have eternal life. But it's these, Jesus says, that testify about me. And you're unwilling to come to me so that you can have life. So what are we saying? It's not so much what you're getting to know, it's who you're getting to know. 
And so it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for six seconds or 60 years. The Bible directs you and I to pay more attention to our relationship with the Trinity, with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, than with our sin. Okay. As we wrap up, in the spirit of full disclosure, I hesitated to make this next slide, but the principle is so plainly spelled out. So please, do not see heresy here. Okay? For you Trekkies out there, ready? What did Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Enterprise mean when he declared, engage? What did he mean? Yeah, get going, move forward. Get it into gear, make it so, yeah. Yeah, get going. Similarly, God the Father encourages you and I to engage. What does he encourage us to engage in? We engage our mind with the position I've given you. The Bible nowhere calls you, a Christian, a, a saved sinner. Never says that. What does he call you? A saint. I'm a child of God. That's my position. And then he says, engage your feelings. Continually be responsive to me. You've been responsive to all the junk in your life. You can be dead to that. Respond to me. And then he says, engage your actions. By marching yourself over to God and becoming more preoccupied with the Father than with your sins, your hurts, and your slights. Be preoccupied with me. Let's pray together. Father, as we uh, we come to the end here, I thank you that you have made it very real to us that you have taken care of the stuff in our lives. We thank you for this. And, And Father, I'm asking this morning that by your spirit, that would sink down to the hearts of those who have listened this morning, that they would be able to understand and appreciate just what's been happening and what's happening to them, that they have this new newness of life. They can be dead, a corpse to sin, and then be alive to you. Father, the evil one is beaten on them because whenever we sin, whenever I sin, the devil reminds me (laughs) that I screwed up. But I've got to press into the fact that your son has paid for that sin And I want to be more preoccupied with you because that will keep me from sliding back into that. Father, thank you for those great truths. In Jesus' name, amen.